broadcasting from the hills of East Tennessee. You're listening to Justified Radio, where each week we look at one of today's issues through the lens of God's Word. Justified Radio, it's where life meets the Bible. And this is Justified Radio, and I am one of your hosts, Phil Whitmore, joined by my brother in Christ, David Sally from Gravely Baptist Church. And David and I are coming to you today, and uh, actually we're going to change course just a little bit. I think that our last show we said that uh, as we're talking about God, we talked about creation, and we talked about the existence of God and the differing viewpoints of God, and we said that we're going to come back this week and we're going to talk about the scientific and the prophetic evidence in the Bible that shows that the God of the Bible is the one true God. And even as we were sitting here talking before we got started, David, we decided that, boy, that's too much to try to do in 30 minutes. I, yeah, you can't do it. I mean, I think we were trying to do something that you or I, neither one can do. Well, we, we could, and we could do it very badly. Right. Yeah. So, and yeah. So, so what we have decided to do is that we're going to talk about prophecy for at least the next two shows. Right. Okay. Yeah. Today we're going to talk about historic prophecy, prophecy in the Bible that uh, where God reveals things that are going to happen in history that have been confirmed by those events. And then next week on the show, which will be Good Friday, yeah. we're going to talk about messianic prophecy. Mm-hmm. And, and then we'll go from there. We'll see if we need to talk about prophecy anymore, or we'll move on to the scientific evidence in the Bible that yeah. shows that the Bible's the Word of God. Right. So, David, what's the importance of prophecy? Prophecy, to me, is the one thing that really shows me that the Bible can be trusted, should be trusted, and has to be inspired by God himself. When you start studying prophecy and you really start understanding the time frame in which the prophecy was given and then recorded, you can't help but understand that God's in control of all the events throughout history. Right, because you can't make predictions that are... 70 years in advance, 150 years in advance, hundreds of years in advance without being right, without being God. Now, now here's where some would differ with us on this. Some would immediately say, well, now, wait a minute. What about Nostradamus? Nostradamus made predictions that came to pass hundreds of years after the event. Well, not really. And if you'll take the time to study Nostradamus, the predictions that he made that his followers today say show he was a seer, a person who could see into the future, they were very vague. Yes. None of them had a time frame on it. It was simply, it will happen way off somewhere. But when you see prophecy in the Bible, it speaks very precisely not only about what will happen, but when it will happen. Right. And, and it's almost about, it's almost like fortune tellers. And, you know, a lot of times people will buy into and they'll go to a fortune teller and what they don't realize that, that even as they are revealing things about you that you think that they shouldn't know, they start out with very various vague things and start working around to seeing, you know, what takes, what doesn't take. Yeah. If, when you look at horoscope, if you're a person out there today and, and play, I'm not trying to offend you. I'm really not. Yeah, you are. But well, just just call it like it is. Okay, <laughs> I will offend you whether I'm trying to or not. But here's the truth: if you're a person who believes in the horoscope and you say I need to look at my horoscope every day, okay, look at somebody else's horoscope, read it, and see if it doesn't apply equally to your life just as your horoscope did. They're so vague they can't be pinned down. The Bible is so precise that it can't be denied. Right. Well said. And so I want to share with you just when it comes to, to prophecy and the importance of authenticating, I'm going to share a, a verse in the Bible, and then we're going to talk about some of the, the historic uh, prophecies that, that have been revealed. But in Isaiah chapter 41, verses 21 and 22, this, this is the words of the Lord. But, but more than that, it really establishes, it really establishes prophecy as a way to authenticate any one or anything that would claim to be God and worthy of worship. Yeah. And it says, present your case for your idols, says the Lord. Let them show what they can do, says the king of Israel. Let them try to tell us what happened long ago so that we might consider the evidence. 
or let them tell us what the future holds so we can know what's going to happen. And listen to verse 23 of Isaiah 41. He says, yes, tell us what will occur in the days ahead. Then we will know you are God's. In fact, do anything, good or bad, do something that will amaze and frighten us. And so what the Bible says, and and frankly, David, outside of the Bible, is that anyone who can can prophesy, predict the future, and then make it happen just like they've predicted is worthy of being worshipped as God. Right. And our God does exactly that. Exactly that. As a matter of fact, I mean, if you want to look at the biblical description of what a prophet is a prophet is a person biblically decided that has to be a person whose prophecy comes true 100 percent of the time when they're claiming to speak for god when they're claiming to speak for god and if it doesn't then they're shown to be false prophets worthy of death well let's just throw that out here just right now then there are people who claim to speak for God right. in the present, right? whatever it may be. But if they claim to speak for God concerning any topic and whatever they've claimed doesn't occur, then they are a false prophet and are to be ignored from that point on. Absolutely. Th- this is one of the main reasons, and, and people gloss over this, and the Jehovah's Witness try to gloss over this completely. But the Jehovah's Witness founder, Charles Russell, Charles Taze Russell, made prophecies about the time of Christ's return on three different occasions, at least. The fourth one was, and I might be wrong on my date here, but I believe it was 1914, and the Lord didn't come back. So Russell said he did come back, but he just came back secretly. Well, okay, even that shows it not to be a biblical prophecy because when the Lord comes back, it will not be a private event. It will be a very public event. Which goes back to any time, any time anyone claims to be speaking for God or that the Holy Spirit has revealed something to them, it will never, ever, ever contradict God's word. Right, can't. Cannot con- contradict God's word. Right. And so, and and so, there are those who. Now, listen, I'm a cessationist. I I think that you know the sign gifts that you know they have ceased. That God can still do these things, but he but he doesn't do these things. I believe that the Bible is closed canon, mm-hmm. that, that God is not authoritatively revealing new, new scripture to us. Yeah. But there are those who, they make the claim that God is speaking to them and through them, and that when they speak, they're speaking the very words of God that to be obeyed. Right. But if you ever catch them, if you ever catch them saying something, I remember once being invited to a revival and, and I don't remember, and if I did, I wouldn't reveal, but wanted me to come and listen to this, this preacher from somewhere. And, you know, and I went and I looked up his biography on the Internet, and I saw that, and this was during President Obama's administration, but I saw that, that somewhere he had said that God had revealed that President Obama would be assassinated while in office. Well, he, de- he wasn't. Right. He isn't in office. The man is a false prophet. No one should ever go listen to anything that he has to say again. Never again. Right. Okay. So so let's talk about some historical prophets. I love it how we just take off in you know, yeah. any direction. These are called rabbit trails in the <laughs> churches at times. But I, I've got a, a I've got a net behind me on the wall and that's just for these guys. <laughs> there you go. So so what are some of the what are some of the historical prophecies? What are some of the things that that God has revealed over the ages that have come to pass that can be confirmed outside even of the biblical record, David? Yeah, some of the things that I've seen that really astound me are are the facts of the prophecies regarding the movement of God's people from Israel out into the world, then bringing them back to Israel uh, and doing things like that in exactly the time frame he, God, I'm saying he, spoke of in the scriptures. Things like Nebuchadnezzar being used by God to ultimately judge Judah. Now you remember earlier, the northern ten tribes, and by the way, the Mormons who believe that they're part of those lost ten tribes of Israel, those lost ten tribes weren't lost. They were displaced. Yes. They were taken away by the Assyrians, decimated as the Bible says, taken into the four corners of the earth of the time, 
families divided up, taken out. That's how the Assyrians conquered, okay? Those 10 tribes were judged in 722 B.C. Later on, five, uh, well, 605, ultimately 609, really under Josiah, but then 605 when Nebuchadnezzar came into Babylon, began the fulfillment of the literal prophecies of these kingdoms that would take the place of Israel for a while, move them out of their land, but then not only move them out of the land, be used to bring them back into the land and to reestablish Jerusalem as a city, the temple as a place of worship. Amazing things that we could spend days talking about, but we've got a few minutes. Right. And that's uh, that's why I want it to be, I want part of our ministry here at Justified Radio to be to encourage people to believe the Bible and study the Bible. Not not just even take air word for no, it. No, look at what it says. Because I guarantee you, now I, I can't speak for David, I guarantee you that I will tell you sometime, not on purpose, but I'm going to tell you something that's wrong. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, we try to talk about, I mean, when you're talking about the Bible, you can talk about precise dates. You can talk about precise people. And sometimes we're going to misspeak. Yes. Just the way it is. Don't mean to. Nope, but, but we're we human. That's, we're you know, human. speaking off the top of our head. Yeah. Uh, so that's why we want you to be a, a people of the book. I don't care if you're Presbyterian, United Methodist, uh, Baptist of all the ilks that Baptists are. Uh, I don't care where you're at in the Pentecostal realm, charismatic. I don't care if you're Catholic. We all need to get back to the Bible. This needs to be our standard, our rule, our guide for faith and practice. Just this. And nothing more. Okay, so so let's talk about the Bible, and let's talk about, especially when it comes to Israel, or more specifically, Judah, the southern kingdom of Judah. Yeah, which is, and, and there's an important distinction, because Judah is the part of Israel that followed the Davidic line, the Messiah's line. Yes. Not the northern uh, ten tribes that rebelled went out originally under Jeroboam, and then, you know, had Ahab had all these ungodly kings. They didn't have a single godly king up north. Not a one. Not a one. And down south, they had troubles. <laughs> had a few godly kings, not yes, many. No. But still, the Davidic line, David's line, was fulfilled and followed, and you can trace that all the way down to our Savior. Right. And, and in fact, I guess when we talk Messianic prophecy, yeah. that we will touch on the fact that, that the line of David extended all the way to Jesus, both mm-hmm. through through Mary, the bloodline, mm-hmm. but also through, also through Joseph, his stepfather, as it will, yeah. or as it were. So, right. But Jeremiah, you know, we, we start when we talk about Judah, and, and very specific, that Jeremiah actually predicted in Jeremiah 25, and we're going to put notes with this episode. So if you're listening to the podcast, there will be show notes. If you're watching this on YouTube, there'll be notes. And I'll put uh, scripture references so you can read them for yourself. But Jeremiah actually predicted in Jeremiah 25, verses 11 through 12, that Babylon would come and rule over Judah for 70 years. And in fact, here, here's what it says. It says, this entire land will become a desolate wasteland. Israel and her neighboring lands will serve the king of Babylon. Ultimately, that was Nebuchadnezzar uh, to begin with for 70 years. Mm-hmm. Not that they would eventually, right? But, but that it's going to happen, David, and it's going to happen specifically for 70 years. And then verse 12 says, then after the 70 years of captivity are over, I'll punish the king of Babylon and his people for their sins. Yeah. Yeah, this this is an, this is one of the most, and 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 feel I I always hate saying most. That's why I try to say one of the most. But there are some prophecies in Scripture that are so monumental and so precise and so wonderful that I almost have to put these are some of the most wonderful prophecies in the Scriptures. This one's so precise that it can't be denied. Right, because we as Christians, we don't want to fall into the same trap as those who who follow or claim that uh, Nostradamus yeah. was a prophet. We, and and we're bad Christians. There's some that that will go and and listen. We will pull anything out and and say this is prophecy. That there's something secret hidden in here that that foretell this. That we're just looking for something like that. Right. But Jeremiah, this is, listen, this is different. This isn't us grasping for something. Not us having to conjecture, not us having to say, you know, I think. No. All the thoughts have been taken out of it. The statement's been made clearly. 
Okay. And then, and then, and we'll, we're going to talk about Daniel in a minute, but, but then we get to Isaiah and we get to Isaiah chapter 13, verse 19. And Isaiah says that, that Babylon's kingdom, this, this same kingdom that's going to overthrow and rule Judah for 70 years, says that that kingdom is going to be permanently overthrown. It says, Babylon, the most glorious of kingdoms, the flower of Chaldean pride, will be devastated like Sodom and Gomorrah when God destroyed them. Yeah. Now, this was written. This was written at around 700, 680 B.C., somewhere in there. Yeah. And then the historic record shows that in 539 B.C. This happened. That yeah. Yep, 539, Cyrus, the Medo-Persians, come in, take the land. They've been preceded by Babylon, who mm -hmm. came into the land in 605. Babylon was in the land, ruling strongly in the land for 70 years. One of the greatest kingdoms the world's ever known. Yes. And all of a sudden, in a night, history shows this, in a night, they were overthrown, done away with, to rise no more by the kingdom of the Medo-Persians led by King Cyrus, who was named in Isaiah as well to be the king who would come and was named that some 150 years before he came. Now, it's amazing. Now tell me more about that because, listen, first of all, it's just unbelievable that Jeremiah has predicted that by name that Babylon's going to conquer Judah and, and rule over them for 70 years. Yeah, Isaiah has predicted that that rule is going to end and that Babylon is going to be utterly destroyed. And now you're telling me that the destroyer of Babylon, that God's word mentions him, not that it's going to happen, but mentions him by name? By name. Where can we find that by at? By name. This is Isaiah chapter 44, verse 28. God's speaking. God's speaking through the prophet Isaiah. And he said, it is I, God speaks, who says, Cyrus, he is my shepherd. Now, that's amazing because a shepherd's one who cares for a flock, okay? A shepherd's one who has an intimate concern for those over whom he has charge. And here, you and I are shepherds. We're under shepherds, under shepherds of the yes. great God of heaven, but we're under shepherds. But nonetheless, we are shepherds of the flock at Bloomingdale for you, at Gravely for me. And here God says this Cyrus, this Medo-Persian king, warlord, if you will, is going to come in and care for Israel. How's he going to do that? Well, it says, It is I who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd. The possessive is used there to make sure we understand that this Cyrus belongs to God. It, this is one of the amazing things. God never backs away from the fact that he ordains all the works of history. Not only as some of us believe here in America, but all over the world. Yes. And he's doing that for a purpose. Cyrus is a shepherd of God. It says, and he will perform all my desire, God says. I mean, this is, this is a guy, Cyrus doesn't know God, the true God of Israel. Right. But God's using him in such a way that he says he will perform, God says, Cyrus will perform my desire. And like you, you alluded to, even when Nebuchadnezzar you know, overthrew uh, the southern kingdom of Judah, he was doing God's work. Yeah, doing God's will. Yes, God, God will use, God will use the saved and the unsaved yeah. to carry out his divine will for the earth. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, and we know that God's in charge, yeah. but sometimes he uses the unsaved, unbeliever to do God's will because the believer and the saved aren't. Right. No, that's, <laughs> so, that's exactly right. But anyway, he, here in Isaiah, he's talking about these things, but um, what... What just grabs me by the throat in all this is the precision. I mean, just the ultimate precision. You already alluded to the fact that it was declared it was going to be for 70 years, okay? Some people will say, well, I don't know if it was exactly 70. Well, even if you think that way, it was so close to 70 that really you don't have a leg to stand on if you say it's not. Right. But if you want to get precise and you want to say 70, you can use 70 in several different ways. We'll talk about those next time. That's, because that's right. they're, they're part of they're part of messianic prophecy, but also part of the precision of the Bible. But again, here in Isaiah 44, it's talking about Cyrus. This is written 
somewhere in the neighborhood of 150 years before the event. That's when Isaiah was writing this prophecy. Cyrus comes into the land uh, in 539 B.C., uh, decimates, ruins, Babylon takes over. Um, he goes on and he says, and he declares of Jerusalem here in the midst of verse 28 in Isaiah 44, and he declares of Jerusalem, she will be built. Will be? What do you mean will be? Will be's future tense. Right. Right. That's what he's saying. When under Cyrus's rule, Jerusalem, under the Medo-Persian rule, really, Jerusalem will be built, and your temple, the foundation of it, will be laid. Now, that's important, because there, when Israel was finally allowed to go back, or Judah, we'll just say it plain, it was Judah who was allowed to go back, they went back under the edict of Cyrus, the king of the Medo-Persian Empire. He allowed them to go back. He even funded them on their way back, allowed them to go back with his money to accomplish the things they were wanting to accomplish. They go back and they begin the work of rebuilding their temple. This is very important for Jerusalem to have that temple erected and be there. They go back and they start that building process and right in the midst of it, they're being persecuted by Sanballat and others. You can read about those. But the problem is they stop their building. They get afraid. They just quit. They don't begin again until 520 B.C., they finally go back under the preaching of um, um, Ezra. I, yeah, no. <laughs> oh, no. Gosh, Phil. Sorry, my mind went blank on me there. This happens a lot to me anymore. But under the preaching of uh, Zechariah, Hagan oh, and Zechariah. Yeah, yes. Hagan and Zechariah. They, they literally preach to Israel. They say, God, you're living in, in walled houses and built houses and God's nowhere. You're, you're neglecting his temple. So they start building the temple again, 520 B.C., by 516, they have built it, and they've dedicated it. Okay, and we can talk about the time frame there, but this is, what, this is what he's talking about here in Isaiah. He's talking with great precision about what will happen. Only God could do this. No, nobody could do this just by trying to prophesy, trying to see out in the future. No, he says, and of the temple, your foundation will be laid. Notice he didn't say the building will be built, because under Cyrus... Only the foundation was laid. Right. Right. And, and then, and we're trying to limit these to, to yeah. 30 minutes. So and It's and hard to do. It's hard to do. <laughs> and then there's the entire book of Daniel. Yeah. Well, when we talk about fulfilled historic prophecy, we're, we're really only talking about half the book of Daniel. Yeah. But, but in the book of Daniel, and, and Daniel is serving Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon, Daniel reveals to us through God revealing to him, okay? He reveals the, the order of what's going to happen really throughout the rest of history, but certainly until the time of the birth of Christ that he sees the Medo-Persian Empire coming and destroying the Babylonian Empire. Right. Okay, and... and and so that's really that's not that remarkable because you know the the Persian Empire, the Medo Persian Empire, they were already around at the time. So it wasn't remarkable to to say they were going to destroy the Babylonians. But but he sees beyond that, and he sees the Greek the rise and the fall of the Greek Empire. Right now now this is this is hundreds of years before there's a Greek Empire. Mm -hmm. He sees Alexander the Great not by name. But, but the description, his youth, his short time here on earth, how fast that he, he you know, conquered the world, his demise, the splitting up of his kingdom into four different parts. Yep. Under his four generals. Under his four generals. Yep. You know, we can even say the Seleucids and the Ptolemies that he, he saw all that. I mean, this is more than, golly, I, I remember trying to preached through Daniel and we spent a year. This is, and probably didn't go as far as we should have. Right. All the way down to the demise of the Greek empire through the Roman empire. Yep. So, and, and all of this, in fact, Daniel, and, and we were talking earlier, we always get together and we talk before we record. And you were talking about that, that the book of Daniel and Isaiah and these other prophecies, that they are so accurate that doubters have started, they can't deny their accuracy, and so they end up denying when they were written. Right, when they were written or who wrote them. 
Yes. Uh, the, the critics of Isaiah. Isaiah has so many precise prophecies in it. You can't deny their their truth, so you have to deny their their writer. And they try to say, well, there was two Isaiahs. There may be three Isaiahs. No, God knew that. And by God saying that now, I'm talking about Jesus. Because we know that Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, is God. Right. I say that in the present tense on purpose because he is God now. He said he was the great I am several times in John's gospel. But we go on and we start realizing that Jesus knew in this day in which we live that some of the naysayers out there will be saying, well, there were two or there were three Isaiahs. Well, no, in, in, in John chapter 12, I think it's verse 38 and 39, Jesus quotes from Isaiah, and he quotes from the two halves of Isaiah that everybody talks about. And he taught, he quotes from both of them and attributes them both to Isaiah. Now, just in that, you can either say, well, either Isaiah wrote the whole book or Jesus was confused. You know, another reason we put our faith in Scripture, and, and there are many reasons, is you know you have the fulfilled historic prophecy you have uh you have the science that's revealed to us you have you know just what nature shows us compared to what the bible has revealed to us but also the bible was written over what over 3500 years or so and yet no contradiction that right. that from genesis to revelation 40 different authors or so that every bit of it that it comes together and it fits together like a, a puzzle. Yeah. That that without without God being behind it, it couldn't have happened that way. Right. That that's what uh, Adrian Rogers used to always say. He said, you know, when people come up to you and they say, well, the Bible's contain the Bible contains all kinds of contradictions. Just challenge them. Say, well, okay, show me one of them. Right. And Adrian Rogers said it had been his. It had been revealed to him so many times that when you just do that one simple thing, okay, well, you say it's full of contradictions, then show me one of them. Generally and usually, they can't show you even one. See, there you go. And and as Christians, if ever we think we find a contradiction, that just proves that we need to study more that that we're wrong. Right. Yeah. If you if you if you come up with a plan and you think, well, I found a contradiction in the Bible, trust me, honey, you're wrong. <laughs> You're wrong. You need to spend some time in the book, not just your particular pet scripture, not your devotion of the day, but in the book. Yes. Now, David, closing us out because we're, we're getting to our 30-minute, our self-imposed time limit. Share with us the first prophecy in the Bible and the prophecy that we'll be following up on next week on, on what will be Good Friday. Right. The first prophecy of the Bible is shown up. It shows up in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. It's talking about the promise of the Messiah who would come, the one who would come, who would be injured, but who would crush the head of the one who injured him. Yes. Now, that's talking about Jesus' literal, and we might say it plainly, battle with Satan. I, I say battle because I want to say it in the way it is. We are in a struggle here in this earth. Right, but we're on the winning side if you're a Christian now, and it's still a battle. Uh, we've got to go through this battle, but take heart. We're on the victorious side, uh, and that's what's important. But uh, Genesis chapter three verse fifteen, God's speaking, and this is after the fall in the garden. And this is the judgment that comes. God says, "I will put enmity between you and the woman," and He's speaking to Satan, and He says, "And between your seed and her seed, He shall bruise you on the head." and you shall bruise him on the heel. And so next week, when we come back together, we're going to talk about the prophecies in the Old Testament concerning the coming Messiah right. and how they were fulfilled to the letter with the birth of our Savior Jesus Christ, his life, his death, and his resurrection. Right, right. So. Until next time, we're Justified Radio, and remember, you can check us out on the web at justifiedradio.org. You've been listening to Justified Radio, where life meets the Bible. You can find us on the web at justifiedradio.org, where you can submit questions, subscribe to our podcast, and find links to our social media. That's justifiedradio.org. Until next time, thanks for listening.